one of my favorites for a long time. I've been a fan of this man who's got his first book out, a novel. I'm holding it up here just to, just to prove it exists. It's Harold by the great Stephen Wright here in the Rich Eisen Show studio. How are you, Stephen? Good to I'm see good, you. I'm good, Rich. How are you? I am doing very, very well. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So uh, I don't know where to just jump in with you. So you are you're a New Englander, correct? That's yes, where you're sir. from originally, yep. from Boston, Burlington, Massachusetts, a suburb outside of Boston. Okay. So uh, back in the day, that would make you a Red Sox fan. Is that what you are Red from back Sox, in the day? Bobby Orr, Bruins Day, uh -huh. you know, like all of that. Kalia oh. Stremski, Tony Canigliaro. That's it. Sixties. Early 70s. Early 70s. Jim Rice era of the Boston Red Sox. Yeah. What was your first time you were in Fenway Park, Stephen? Uh, what was I, that? I don't know. My father took us probably, I was probably 12-ish. You know, it was so laid back then. He would come home from work. Uh -huh. It wasn't even a plan. It was like, oh, let's go to the game. You know, we'd get in the Volkswagen, <laughs> drive 45 minutes in. I mean, I sound like one of those guys, but it was like you sit in the bleachers for like two dollars. Yeah, there's no one. No one was, a, you know, you have no all the space. It was it was before they became, you know, even before '67. Sure. When did you try stand up for the first time? When did you realize, okay, were you always funny, or you, your your understatedness was just your personality all the time? Well, this is, you know, this is just how I talk like this, but I was funny with my couple buddies mm -hmm. in school. Yes. I wouldn't, wouldn't want the classes to make the class laugh. Yeah. But I was just funny with them, and uh, I would watch The Tonight Show all the time with Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. My brother was four years older than me, so we had to watch what he wanted. Mm -hmm. and, he, and so I, he, I would just watch him, and eventually I, I, you know, everyone would be asleep, and we'd be watching Johnny, and yep. then I suddenly hooked in, like, see a guy come out and mm -hmm. talk about life and all this weird angles, funny uh, reflection of what he experienced, and I, I started to hook into that, and then Johnny himself, I loved it, and it became like a this magical thing, I. Really, that's when I was really drawn to it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, maybe I, I would like to do that, maybe, to be one of those guys. And then, speaking of the Bruins, so I would listen to the Bruins on the radio mm -hmm. in bed. And one night I was fooling around with a dial, and I stumbled on this comedy show. A guy in Boston, he played two comedy albums every Sunday night. Yeah. Two whole albums. So then I hooked into that. So I'm tuning into that for like two years, and I'm like studying it without knowing it. Yeah. I'm thinking, oh, I like that guy. Oh, that's it. Oh, I don't know. So then, then the Tonight Show and Carlin, and then it became like my dream, like a kid wants to be a baseball player yeah. or an astronaut. And, and you wanted was, to be a comic. Yeah. So when did you, when was your first big break, Stephen Wright? When was that? Well, I went. I started doing it when I was 23 in uh, Boston, and in the clubs. And uh, in Cambridge, there was a Chinese restaurant comedy club called the Ding Ho Comedy Club. It <laughs> okay. was it's just this, you know, the front was a like with a audience and everything in the bar, and then the back was a Chinese restaurant. And someone wrote an article about it because it was such a bizarre situation. Yeah. And for some reason, it went in the L.A. Times. I don't know why. And then Peter LaSalle, who was the producer of The Tonight Show. Sure. He saw the article. And then, like, eight months later, he was going to Boston. To, his kids were going to get out of high school. So he was, they had a summer trip to look at colleges in New York and Boston. And he remembered the club. So he called up and he said he was going to go there and he went there and, and and then he saw me and then three weeks later I was on The Tonight Show. On The Tonight yeah. Show. So he, it, it was like a fairy tale. So you know? if you didn't do your comedy in a Chinese restaurant, do you think you'd have been discovered, Stephen? I mean, obviously, or n maybe not as quickly by... Not, a, not, as, not as quickly. What the hell is that uh, like for you to be on The Tonight Show three well, weeks after being in a Chinese restaurant? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what, did it, what I just say, was yeah, that... I don't know if that's, and if that's false, if anything no, I just said was true, false. It's true, it was just the way you assembled <laughs> it three weeks after. 
<laughs> you could have yeah. said that to Neil Armstrong. Well, you're on the Chinese restaurant, then you're on the moon. Like, how do you know? Like, it, 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 yes, it was, one was... from column A, one from column Johnny. I mean, my gosh, from back in the column day. Column Johnny. Yeah. It was surreal because they just explained how big that show was to me yeah. for all those years. Sure. So then to be on there, uh, it was just magical. And I've remained friends with Peter all, all these years. You know, I mean, would I, a lot of my career has been a lot of flukes. A lot of accidents. But, I mean, I know that I do what I do, but you need, there's other things involved to just for something to happen somewhere. You know, like the, the Chinese restaurant, the person writes the article. Why is it in the L.A. Times? The places in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The co kids going to college. Going summer trip. So when this you start taking off, HBO reaches out to you and you... You were one of the first to have a, a comedy special on Home Box Office, Stephen. Well, Carlin had them, Steve Martin. And, right. Yeah, so when I went on The Tonight Show, then everything changed. Touring, live, clubs, and then HBO, and then an album, and then playing theaters. And it was all because of Peter LaSalle and Johnny Carson. So you got a good Carlin story, Stephen? Well, I, I met him several times, which was like, oh, my God, I'm talking to George Carlin. Right. He was a very regular guy he was just a regular guy but genius he's a genius a lot of people um, from my generation of comedians mm. have him on the mount rushmore oh, for sure you know i mean the the amount i think he did 18 hbo's mm -hmm. so even volume and how the quality mm -hmm. he's one of my heroes in my whole life so who else is on your mount rushmore uh of comedians Richard Pryor, mm -hmm. um, Dave, David Brennan, Robert Klein, those guys from when I was saying, when sure. watching all that time. Right, starting out. Right. Tell me about your book, Harold. Uh, why write it? What, what, what made you want to sit down and, and come up with your first book and a novel? What made you do this, Stephen? Well, I wrote a, a fairy tale about how the beach was invented. It was in Rolling Stone magazine along 80, 1986. And every few years I would read it again. Just, and then I thought I should write something else. Mm -hmm. So then I was on Twitter and I started writing. I thought I'll write a story, but I'll write it on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'll write two sentences at a time mm -hmm. rather than jokes. So I kept writing it and people were leaving messages saying, doesn't he know this is for jokes? Because he's writing a novel on Twitter. What, what is, someone should explain this to him. But I didn't like the idea of the jokes on Twitter. Sure. To me, the joke is a live experience. Where they're feedback from the audience, Yeah, it's a whole thing. So then I stopped writing it on Twitter, but I continued writing it anyway. Just kept going, like just not knowing where it's going or anything. You know, the jokes are very distinct couple sentences through a small window right. to make the audience laugh. A concept, you know, nah, 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 and then the audience laughs. But I had other things in my mind that wouldn't go through that window. Mm -hmm. So I used this uh, boy, his name is Harold. I essentially like put a funnel on the top of his head and I poured everything I think about life mm -hmm. into his head. So it's like he's thinking it. No seven-year-old would really be thinking what he's thinking. Yeah. But I, I got to express basically my experience of and, and my reaction to this whole thing of having a life. There's so much information, you mm -hmm. know, so I got to say, say a lot of it through his mind. In a book where all books uh, can be uh, acquired on May 16th is when it, it comes out. Uh, Harold, written by Stephen Wright. Um, what is, I, I guess, uh, this may be a ridiculous question, but I'll ask it anyway. What's your favorite joke that you came up with? Do you got one? Out of your vast career? One when you're I like, I do oh. have a favorite joke, but it's not the audience's favorite joke. Okay. It's, I say, I went to uh, my grandfather when he died. I went to the funeral and I was kneeling down at the casket, looking at him inside the casket. Mm -hmm. And I started to think about my flashlight. 
And I was thinking about the batteries inside my flashlight. And then I thought, maybe, maybe he's not dead. Maybe he's just in the wrong way. <laughs> like in the casket the wrong yeah, way? Yeah, you know how battery... <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, maybe if he was the other way, he'd be alive. He's gone, he's gone over there. I mean, you said it may not be the audience's favorite joke, but it's Chris is gone. He's, <laughs> Because that happens. You put that and it doesn't work. Well, the joke is based on years. You take batteries out that are dead and you put them on the table. Then you take the new ones out of the pack and you put them on the table. Yeah. Then, you, then you go in and do something else for something and you come back. You can't tell a dead battery from a <laughs> live battery just from looking at it. So, this is what you're saying, thinking at your grandfather's funeral, that if you had removed him from the casket and just flipped him over, he'd be alive? Yeah, like the batteries. Like the batteries. No, no. No, as oh, I'm man. saying this to you guys... As I'm saying this to you, I don't yeah. know how or why my mind assembled, uh, not connected it. I don't know that part. Out but of that my, moment. But my subconscious is like an insane factory that somehow, oh, this could be this. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm, 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 like I'm, so I'm mandated to yeah. follow up. So is. Good. In this equation, is your is your grandfather triple A, double A, C, <laughs> D? I mean, no one's ever asked. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I would say is nine volt is your grand, is, 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 is grandpa nine, nine volt? volt? I mean, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> it's so funny. I never even thought of that. That's great. Well, there you go. I'm just trying to leave you in a better spot than I found you. Wow. <laughs> Did you tell that to somebody on the spot? Like at no. the funeral? Or you just you No, you, that wasn't real. Oh, it's not real. Oh. No. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I thought no, well, you no, you no. I you asked you, me uh, you, what was my favorite, favorite joke. joke. Oh, okay. And I said, Okay, so I'm at my father's funeral. Oh, you guys uh, thought that was real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was real. Yeah. Oh. Did you feel like that at, yeah. at that moment you were like, I gotta think of a joke right now? Oh my oh, gosh. Oh, that's <laughs> unbelievable to think that really there happened. Go, that's a whole other perception. This is a great experience. This no is... one's ever thought it really happened. Yeah. And no one said is the triple A. <laughs> <laughs> Well, right. it's a first for everything. First for everything. You have a question over there, TJ? You no know, questions. It's just like, this is really surreal for me, Stephen, because, you know, I, I think I discovered you way back when I was in elementary school and oh, I was wow. trying to, you know, listen to Eddie Murphy and Pryor and Carlin. But they, and you can just talk to me through your monitor there. But oh. of course, they curse so much that I would get yelled at. But my mom, I could get away with listening to you because you were clean. But what I would do is I would write your jokes down in a book and I really? would go to like fifth, sixth grade and I would do stand up based on jokes that you told. How so this is that? really surreal to me, man, to, to see you. And I just like your style, like you were just describing. When did you decide that that was the way that you were going to tell your well, jokes. Yeah, because I imagine people would be like, you're not energetic enough, you're you're really low energy or anything like that. And by the way, I still have four that I tell to this day almost. You do? Are, yeah. Um, my, yeah, growing, grow, can I say them? Yeah, yeah, growing, yeah. Up, growing up, my parents had the quick sandbox in the backyard. I was an only child, eventually. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I spilled spot remover on my dog, and now he's gone. That's a good um, one. That's a good there one. was one about a dude, your friend Dennis, he had, I want, I want to be PC here, he had smaller parents, but he wasn't small, he was a dwarf, and he would pose for trophies. Yeah, he was I, the guy that, yeah. wow, that's, <laughs> ama that's amazing. Like, so I would tell these in elementary school, wow. that's how much, so like I said, this is a trip for me right now, because I literally had a notebook, and I would write these down, because I couldn't tell any Murphy jokes at school, because, you know, I got sent to the principal's office. Wait, I that's heard fantastic, it's real for me to hear you say that because when you're performing writing and everything you're not thinking about a little kid in elementary school like just so to for you to tell me all that it's a whole other it's a very touching story from my point of view well that's wonderful i'm glad that you told it then tj and yeah. and, and 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 i never thought it would be touching th that story to be told when it involves uh, apparently uh, somebody who is a model for a small little trophy, <laughs> yes. Stephen. Like you look at a small trophy and say that must be like two size, an actual model. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man. 
he, I'll say it the way you said it. He's not a midget. He's a midget dwarf. Derek and Campbell's. he poses for trophies. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah he was this big. He was the guy who tro posed for trophies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really flattered. That's great that you that you love it like that. Yeah, but man. You ask me how my style. I mean, I just wrote jokes. I went to the comedy club to a mm -hmm. uh, open mic, and then I thought I'm going to come back in two weeks. So I wrote things in that two weeks, and for some reason they came out like little jokes. Yeah. And, and then I just said them, you know, and this is how I talk. So accidentally, that type of joke with how I speak merged and it was just an ad there was no like oh it was no plan like I'll do it like this and then I'll do this and it was in Boston there was no show business in Boston so there was nobody to say you gotta talk louder and you gotta right. make sell stories we were all left on our own and we just very distinct comedians and Dennis Leary and Bobcat Goldthwait yeah. and Paul Poundstone and Kevin Meany and uh, Steve Sweeney and Lenny Clark and well now you got Bill Burr who is as, oh, as, Bill Burr. as New England you as know, they come yes yes I mean I love yeah, Bill he, he's he's brilliant that guy for sure Stephen how'd you get involved with Half Baked where you famously played the, the guy on the couch uh, it was a talk show on at midnight to one in the morning, and I think Bob Costas was the host. Mm -hmm. And then one time, Dave Chappelle was the guest host, and I was his guest. So when the show was over, I said, yeah, we should be in a movie together. And he said, oh, I'm making a movie right now. Do you want to be in it? And I said, uh, yeah, all right. And that's how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Very all because Bob Costas went on vacation. The guy on <laughs> yeah, the see, later. See? I was later, but... I did not, and you were, and you're the voice in, of the DJ in the re, in Reservoir, Reservoir Dogs, right? Dogs, yeah. What it did did uh, Tarantino just reach out to you? No, what happened was <laughs> there's all these flukes. I made a short film called The Appointments of Dennis Jennings, yeah. directed by Dean Parasol and Sally Menke. She edited the movie, and then a few years later, she was editing Reservoir Dogs, and. She was talking to him. They had the concept of the guy on the radio, but they didn't have the voice. And she just said, how about Stephen Wright? Because I was friends with her for a few years. And he said, oh, yeah, I like that. See how all these accidents. And it all works out. And I'm so thrilled that you were out here in Los Angeles on your book tour. Again, everybody, check out Harold. Uh, get it. You can pre-order it right now. And the books come out. Um, Harold comes out on May 16th. A pleasure. Thanks for yeah. being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. You guys. bet it. Thank Absolutely. You. I'm glad that TJ got to meet somebody whose work he was ripping off as yeah. a child. I definitely <laughs> stole. I definitely <laughs> stole out your jokes and, and and I thank you for it. And uh, and I and I'm I'm thrilled that I was able to uh, add on to uh, one that of was your favorite tremendous. jokes. Tremendous. <laughs> That's <laughs> tremendous. <laughs> I mean, there's different types of batteries that Grandpa could be, or your father could be. Uh, Thank Steve, you for having me. Thank you, you very much. Absolutely. Everybody, check out Harold May 16th and get it uh, right now. You can pre-order it. Stephen Wright right here on The Rich Eisen Show. Catch The Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.